for the Son of thy love, for Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Let's go to God in prayer. Another uh, congregational song in a moment, but I'd like to... Just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one. That silver line I've got a mansion Just over the hilltop In that bright land Where we'll never grow old And someday young more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Don't think
Well, I'm glad that each of you are here with us this evening at the beginning of our revival. We've been looking forward to having Aaron. Uh, you've been announced uh, even before we knew the date, so we knew it was going to be in November, and we certainly want to thank Aaron for uh, scheduling us uh, on short notice. And I don't know why it's our fault. We always have plenty of time to schedule Aaron, but we forget to do it. And uh, so, uh, Aaron, we'll try to do better at that because he just gets busier and busier and busier. And uh, the church that he's, uh, his home church that he preaches at is growing uh, rapidly. They've, I think they had their third remodeling done uh, in, since he's been there at the church. And uh, they're really doing well. And, uh, and we understand why, because they've got good leadership. They have a great preacher, great preacher's wife, and great preacher's kids. Uh, I didn't get to be there last Sunday, but two of his children, uh, the two of the oldest boys, Silas 14 and Deacon 11, preached. And uh, I'm hoping that they'll get to come here sometime on a Sunday night and share those messages, and uh, I did get to see them online, and it, and it was wonderful uh, to see them. So uh, Stephanie will be with us tomorrow night to um, sing. Uh, she and the children are working on their Christmas play, or they would probably be here with us uh, tonight. So uh, Aaron will be uh, leading our service for us uh, tonight. We're going to sing a, a congregational song. And, um, and then Sherry will be coming just before Aaron does and present us a, a special in song as well. So at this time, if you'll turn to page 273, we'll use verses 1, 2, and 4. Like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because He first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of what whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. And in each sorrow he bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. The hymn of invitation is 640. If you want to turn to that now in your books. And at this time, Sherry will be presenting our uh, special for the evening, and, and then uh, Aaron will be coming and preaching for us. And then following the message tonight, an invitation, those of you who will be taking communion, you will have an opportunity to do that uh, after the invitation song. Ed, uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Bob. Enjoyed your special as well, and uh, thank you for all your kind words. I can't say anything about the preacher at East Point, but the preacher's wife and the preacher's kids are something special. 
you be sure and tell her I said that tomorrow when you see her. And, uh, <clears throat> Lord willing, they, they'll be here tomorrow. They were at uh, play practice and things this evening and uh, needed, needed to be there. Couldn't make it over with me, but uh, they do send you greetings. Hopefully, Lord willing, they'll be here tomorrow. Uh, excited to be here and uh, been looking forward to it. So I'm going to jump in. Uh, hope to be talking for sure about David the next couple nights. That's King David. Man after God's own heart. We're going to see tonight, we're looking at where he really comes on the scene in a really powerful way. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We're going to use verses 45 and following, a few verses of Scripture. But in 1 Samuel 17, what's happened is there's a conflict between the Israelite army and the army of the Philistines. And according to verse number 2, it says they're lined up in the valley of Elah. That's E-L-A-H. They're lined up in the valley of Elah, the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other. And it's like you can hear the little guy in the middle say, Let's get ready to rumble! They're lining up for battle. They've been lined up for a while. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm going to tell a familiar story. I think y'all, most of you, I'd say everybody here has heard the crux of this story today, this account from 1 Samuel 17. But I want to bring you something and hopefully tie in something that maybe you hadn't thought of. And I hope, I hope you can hear what the Spirit says to the church tonight. This message that I call Faith and Fight. We're going to start in verse 45, where King David is quoted, and this is what he says before he goes to fight the giant. He's not the king yet. He's, at this time, a young shepherd boy. He's going to fight the Philistine champion. Starting at verse 45, the Bible says this. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And all the world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know it is not my sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. Let's pray. Down in the valley of Elah, they've been in this valley for some time. In fact, it's been, when you read 1 Samuel 17, verse 16, the Bible says they've been there for 40 days. 40 is just one of those number, re, in this, one of those numbers that reoccurs in Scripture. As you study through the Scripture, God has certain numbers He really likes. He likes 3, He likes 7, He likes 10, He likes 12, He likes 40. You can study that out, but it's unique. They've been here in the valley for 40 days. And as you read 1 Samuel 17, the Philistines have a champion. He is big. He is tall. And although the Bible doesn't expressly say so, I'm firmly convinced he's also ugly. I just believe that. 
What the Bible says is he's over nine feet tall. His armor weighs more than 100 pounds. His spear shaft was like that of a weaver's rod. The spear had a long weight over 15 pounds. He'd been fighting men from a youth. I mean, he was a big dude. And he was a Philistine champion. And according to verse number 8 of 1 Samuel 17, he's come out, and Goliath has. He's come out with this idea, not unfamiliar to the Jewish people and to the Israelites, but it was representative warfare. Our best man versus your best man, winner takes all. So he comes out. Starting there in verse number 8, he comes out, this Philistine giant, and he goes something, I believe it sounded a little something like this, it's something like, fee fi fo fum give me a man, come get some. What he actually said is, bring your champion. If your best man can defeat me, then we will all be your subjects. But if I defeat your best man, you will become our subjects. <laughs> Give us a man and let's fight. And it has been 40 long days. Morning and evening, this Philistine comes out with a taunt. And as you read 1 Samuel 17, nobody responds. Nobody has the courage. Nobody takes the giant up on the offer. But it just so happened. 1 Samuel 17, that a young man, he was too young to fight in the, armor, in, the, in the army. He goes, he's sent from Bethlehem. His father, Jesse, sends him to check on his older brother, some of which who were old enough to fight and were fighting in the Israelite army. And while he's there to deliver supplies, it just so happened. He got lucky. You know the word luck is not in the Bible. Did you know that? There's no luck involved here. It was God's plan. It was providence while he's there. Here comes this commotion. Here comes this ceremony of some sort. And here comes a Philistine giant with his daily taunt. Give us a man to come fight. And this young Israelite boy has been watching his father's sheep in the wilderness. He looks and he says in 1 Samuel 17 verse 26, Who is this? that he should defy the armies of the living God. Now, it's real important when you read that. 1 Samuel 26, it's important for you and I, it's important for us to realize Israel at this point in time only had one army. Pop quiz. At this point in time, how many armies did Israel have? One. <laughs> you guys are a little sharper than they are at East Point. I said something to that effect at a revival, and somebody from home watched it. And they said, what are you telling about East Point, Mac, at these revivals you preach? They may be tuning in tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Israel had, Israel had, it's a total joke, total joke about the East Point thing. It's not a joke. Israel had one army. But do you see what David said in 1 Samuel 17, 26? He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies with an S? plurality and it's like this young shepherd boy he's young he's inexperienced but he realizes they are the people they are the children of God and if God is on our side we have a majority regardless of how big and strong this giant is who is this guy that he should divide the armies of the living God and what David says gets reported up the ranks and up the ladder and King Saul receives word that this young man might have courage enough to go fight. And as King Saul, you read 1 Samuel 17, he investigates. He says, well, number one, <clears throat> you can't go. You're too young. This man, <clears throat> I appreciate your courage. It's pretty admirable. But this guy's a giant. He's been fighting men from his youth. You can't go. And David says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep in the wilderness. And when the lion and the bear attack the sheep, your servant has struck down and killed both the lion and the bear, and that Philistine will be just like the lion and the bear. I'll strike him down. King Saul said, that's impressive. Somebody fact check him, get on Facebook. Do we see pictures of lions and bears? I don't know how much fact checking he could do. 
But what he couldn't miss here is this young man's got a lot of courage. He's got a lot of tenacity. And King Saul said, well, second thing, you don't have any armor. You need to wear my armor. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot of physical characteristics of a lot of people. In fact, it's rare, it's rather rare if the Bible tells us physical characteristics of people. However, about King Saul, it does tell us something. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2 says that Saul was a head taller than all the other Israelites. Saul, well, he's also described in the Bible, he's handsome. I hear the only thing better than being handsome is being tall and handsome. So I've heard. King Saul had it. He's tall and he's handsome. You get the idea? He's, he's a head taller than everybody. He must buy his clothes at the big and tall store. And he's got armor, and he tries to put it on David. David tries this stuff on. He's walking around. Man, this don't fit. I can't wear this stuff. So he puts away the armor. But they're at the end of their wits here. You see what I'm saying? It's been 40 days. They haven't had a man brave enough to go. they got to do something. Something's got to give. How many more days of embarrassment and humiliation can we tolerate? we got to try something. And they know it's a bad idea. And they know this young man, what chance does he have against a nine-foot-tall giant? But we got to do something. And as you read 1 Samuel 17, David doesn't have any armor on, but he does go down the stream. He picks five smooth stones, and he goes with his shepherd's sling and five smooth stones in the back. Now, at this point in time, David is young and he's inexperienced, but you know David who becomes king, David. David who is full of wit and wisdom. David who is a poet. We know he can play the harp and he can play very well. That's why he was contracted to play for King Saul. He was, he was a music man. He wrote many psalms of which are recorded in the Bible. So those were played, many of them widely accepted. They're played to music. He was a music man. He was a songwriter. He was one time, one time he was in Philistine territory while Saul was trying to kill him. And he pretended to be insane and he pulled it off. And I know some of y'all could probably pull it off too, but you know what I'm saying? Most of us couldn't pull that off. But it says he was scratching the door frame and he let saliva run down his beard and he pretended to be insane and he got by with it. I mean, he was an actor. He was poetic. He was a music man. I mean, King David was something special. What is he going to say? He's going into battle in 1 Samuel 17. This big, huge giant is there. He's got everybody's attention. All of Israel there, they're in the valley. And this man of poetry, he's never, I mean, he always got something to say. And it's always the right thing. It seems at just the right time. And this is what he says. It's where we started a few minutes ago. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and all the world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know, but it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle of the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. When I read something like that in my Bible, I just put a little footnote. Some people don't like to write in their Bible, and I understand that. Maybe that's you, but I like to write in mine. I put a little footnote in there. It just simply said, boom, shot the lock. That's some powerful stuff right there. This guy who goes into battle with such confidence. You read 1 Samuel 17. He takes a stone into the sling. And he delivers one stone, one stone he sends, and he hits that, da- uh, that giant right square in the forehead. And the Bible says, it says it twice, it says it in verse 50, but in case you didn't catch that, it repeats it in verse 51. It says, David killed the giant with the stone. And it says in verse 51, after he killed him, he went over and he pulled the Philistine sword out of its sheath and then he cut the Philistine's head off. And he carried it around for a while when you read the story. But it says, after he killed him, he removed the Philistine's head. He killed him, and after he killed him, he cut his head off. 
without a sword in his hand. Now that's the part of the story I think everybody did anybody not know how that story ended? Like every commentator on every sports channel, it's a, it's a David it's a David and Goliath match. It's Kentucky versus Alabama. Well, Goliath won. If you didn't see that game yesterday, Goliath won again. But it's all, everybody knows the David and Goliath story. But here's what I want to point out. Here's what I want you to think about. David became king, and he was very much a man after God's own heart, save for one huge... Uh, sin that he committed with Bathsheba and what involved there, what was involved there. But David was a wonderful king, a man after God's own heart. And David had in his army, he had men who were very, very brave. How brave were they? I'm glad you asked. In 2 Samuel 23, you read about some of David's men. 2 Samuel 23. One of those men, let's start at verse, I don't know, let's start at verse number 8. One of those men that David had in of his mightiest soldiers, one of those men was named Josheb Bathsheba. Now if you're looking for something good to name a grandbaby or something, I maybe you want to consider it. Josheb Bathsheba. You got a new puppy, I, mean, I don't know. But Josheb Bathsheba, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 8, it says he took his stand against 800 men who he killed in one encounter. You say, what? That's what it says, 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. He took up his spear there. Is it a spear? 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Now, I don't know if y'all watch that MMA fighting. It's, some people say it's bloody. It's hard to watch. It is. Some of you might like it. I don't know. But that MMA fighting, these guys get in there, and they, they are some, there's some bad dudes out there, man. And it's, it's interesting to see what they can do. Maybe that entertains some folks. I don't know. But here's, here's the deal. Who do you know that can take on 800 enemy soldiers? Like train people to fight in a battle. Can you imagine? I mean, we read in the book of Judges how, how Samson, why Samson had this extraordinary power. I don't believe, I do not believe Samson had big muscles because nobody ever said in the entire book of Judges, I bet Samson killed all those people because he had big muscles. Never says that. I think Samson, you get to heaven, you'll say, who's that skinny guy in the corner? Is that Barney Fife? They'll say, no, it's Samson. Shh. That's just my personal thought. But Samson, he killed a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. And Josheb Bathsheba killed 800 men in one encounter. Think about this man. I mean, he's, 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 bad. he's a bad man. You see what I'm saying? But keep reading. 2 Samuel 23, let's look at verse 9 and 10. There's another guy named Eliezer. Now, Eliezer doesn't say exactly how many... How many men did he kill? But what it says about him, it says they were involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat warfare against the Philistines. And all the other Israelites turned and ran. The Israelites were retreating from battle, but Eliezer took his stand in the middle of the field. And he fought the Philistines. When everybody else ran, he stood and fought. And he, he had great victory. The Bible says the Lord brought about great victory that day. And it says... That when the Israelites realized he's in the middle of the field and the battle still ensued, and they decided to go back to help him, they returned, but it's too late. He's already killed all the bad guys. And it says the Israelites returned to help him, but when they returned, they were all dead, and all they could do was strip the dead. But it says the, the sword, the NIV says the sword froze to his hand. Not that it was cold, not a temperature thing. But his hand, he was squeezing that sword and fighting for so long and so hard that he couldn't release the sword out of his hand. Eliezer's a bad man. You're going to pick on somebody, you wouldn't pick on Eliezer. He's a bad dude. Keep reading. Let's go on down a few verses. Let's look at 2 Samuel 23, verse 18. Abishai, Abishai was a brother to Joab. Joab was commander of the royal army, the Israelite army, Joab. His brother Abishai was bad too. 
Now, he didn't kill 800 men in one encounter, but he killed 300. And in my book, if you can, if you can kill 300 men in one encounter, hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's pretty impressive. What about you? Eliezer, Abishai, Josheb, Bathsheboth. David had some mighty men, these men of, of uh, bravery, men of courage, men of great exploits. I mean, these, these guys were tough. In addition to all that, you got guys like uh, 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, make sure I give you the right reference, 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, starting there in verse 22, we read about Ben and I. Ben and I was a Levite. Now the Levites, uh, that's where the priests came from, the Levitical tribe. But Ben and I was, though he was a Levite, he was a bad dude too. And Ben and I, he is told about him, it says that he went into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Now, I think it'd be just as impressive if it wasn't snowing. But the Bible says it was snowing. The weather was against him. He went into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also went, he also went against this Egyptian in a separate encounter. He went against an Egyptian that was seven and a half feet tall. The Egyptian had a spear and he did not have a club. He took a club to a spear fight. And in chapter 11, the Bible says that ben I, son of Jehoiada, he took the spear away from that Egyptian and killed him. <laughs> That's impressive. The point I'm, I'm trying to make here, David had men in his army that were brave, bold, courageous men. These are men of renown. These are men who are, are famous for their exploits and their victories. I mean, these are men's men. I mean, they, they ain't afraid of nothing. The boogeyman looked under his bed for Joshua Bathsheba. You know what I'm talking about? These guys were, these, these were tough of the toughest. Now go back to 1 Samuel 17. When the Bible says in verse number 16, it says that Goliath, the Philistine champion, had stood and had taunted Israel for 40 days. The question I'm asking, where, where's Eliezer at? Where's Joab at? Joab was a man's man. I mean, he was the leader of the Israelite army. He had some flaws. You can read about that as well. But, I mean, he was a tough dude. Where's Abishai at? Where's Joshua at Bathsheba? And we can talk, well, now some of those guys could have been younger than David. Fair enough. But the point I'm making is Israel had a lot of brave, bold, courageous men. And for 40 days, 40 days. A month and ten days, there wasn't nobody had courage enough to answer this Philistine until that shepherd boy showed up. You see, the point I'm making is there's something contagious about bold faith. People who have faith, people who have vision, people who have, it's like they, it's, it's, they're a magnet. They're contagious with what they believe. And, and it catches on. And it is not exclusive just to Bible times. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe they taught you this here in Pike County. Back home, not us, Johnson County, that George Washington was the first president of the United States. They teach you that kind of stuff up here? Yeah, yeah. What, have you read about George Washington? Because I had, I had a professor in law school. He was a very intelligent guy. He went to Princeton University. He wanted to point out how smart he was, and he was smart. I'll give him that. He always wanted to point out, though, something that you know about somebody, maybe some historical figure, frequently try to burst your bubble. If you thought highly of somebody, he's going to tell you otherwise. Some fact that you didn't know, and you'd be like, it can't be true. And you'd look it up, probably was true. But when he said, he said, when it comes to George Washington, the more you read and investigate, investigate about George Washington, you're impressed with General George Washington. Know that he led the troops in the Revolutionary War, widely known fact. You might not know that George Washington stood at six feet and two inches tall, which was really tall for his day. 
Uh, for those of us that are vertically challenged, we still consider that real tall. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But he was a big guy. And for his day, he was really big, considered a really tall guy. And they say when he went into battle, all the accounts that you read about George Washington in battle, like bullets are flying and they're grazing by their heads and all this kind of stuff. And he comes out of the foxholes and other things that they had, any kind of hiding. He goes out in, into the battle just like he couldn't get shot. He was bold. He was like careless in a way. And he was brave. I don't know if you've investigated this rumor, but you can, you can study it out. There is some evidence that in the winter of 1770, 1777 at Valley Forge, that he was baptized, General George Washington, in the Potomac River. You can investigate, see if that's real or not, but that was a big deal because people at that time, in a lot of faiths, they were not actually immersed. But history, one account, teaches that George Washington was. You can investigate that. What I know is I went to the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. Have you ever been there? Some of you have been there. If you ever have a chance to go, man, I encourage you to go. But I saw at the Smithsonian, I saw a letter that George Washington had signed, that had written and, and signed, and sent off while he was a general and the commander in the army. And I'm here to tell you that what I saw behind display at the Smithsonian um, um, Museum, it read just like, I'm telling you, it read just like an epistle from Paul the Apostle. It was George, George Washington. Uh, with grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> he brought all that stuff, and he sent letters home, and he signed it in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he signed and he dated it. I mean, it read just like an epistle, I'm telling you. This man had great faith and great courage. It's documented, and when he went into battle, he went boldly, courageously, without any hesitation. And when they elected the first president in the United States, guess how many votes that George Washington received. Starts with all and ends with of them. All of them. He was unanimously elected president of the United States of America. The point I'm bringing at is there's something about a bold faith. King David was there at the Israelite army when the army had been there for 40 days and nobody had made a move. Church, what I'm telling you is there are people in your life that they're just needing to see the real McCoy. Sherry saw the saying, Sherry sang a beautiful song about if, if we live the truth unashamed, it's going to make an impact, it's going to make a difference. And I'll tell you, the people who need it, it's, it's your relatives and mine. It's people in our own communities, people that need some hope. There's diseases out there, there's darkness, there's accidents, there's, there's companies shutting down, there's uh, insurance problems, and nothing's covered. I'll tell you what insurance covers, whatever you don't have, they cover that stuff. And people are going to doctors from one to the next, and there's bills to pay, and Wendy's it don't cost you, I got, I got three kids. You go to Wendy's, it costs 60 bucks, I'm going to Grazier. And you are still there's a lot of things happening, financial difficulties, problems, struggles, trials. I tell you what the world needs, they need hope. And that's what we've got in Jesus Christ. You see, the problems that we have, the major two problems we have is a sin problem. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we have a death problem. And it turns out when Jesus Christ came, he solved our two problems. He laid his life down for the sin problem. He paid the death mind required it's paid for paid in full and then he was buried he went into the cemetery as a deceased member of society and he came walking out on the third day our problems have been cured our sin problem our death problem it satisfied the death taken care of removed and now the grave is not the end the world needs hope and it's something that you and I can give with how? Just a courageous, bold faith. The world needs it. What is, what is the real thing? Everybody's claiming at different points of the year to follow Christ in some degree. I mean, if you follow Jesus, if you love Jesus, you'll share this email. Everybody's sending stuff. Everybody claims a faith. But what does a real McCoy look like? 
I hope and pray that you and I can show them. Love, not legalism, not legalistic, but, but love, faithfulness, speaking the truth in love, thinking about it, what would Jesus do? Not that we're perfect. Who here struggles with sin? We're not perfect, but we're striving to grow to maturity, to be more faithful, more like Christ. So the fruit of the Spirit will flourish in our lives. And according to Galatians chapter 5, it's love and joy and peace, and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And these things, when you see the real McCoy, is contagious. And that's what I hope to encourage you to do tonight. I wanted to start this revival with a little story of faith and fight. And that's why I've come to this text. David set this nation on fire with a great zeal. One teenager, too young to fight in the army, turned the trajectory of a nation around. Now think of what God can do if you and I just serve and serve faithfully. I hope to encourage you uh, in every way. Love and serve the Lord with all of your heart. The Lord has opened the door. The Lord has opened the door for Stephanie to serve as a, uh, as a board member of the International Disaster Emergency Services. It's IDES. It's probably what you're familiar with. But it's based out of Noblesville, Indiana. We went up a couple days ago for the... Uh, for the first board meeting that she was part of. And what's going on around the world really is amazing. But we, we have a church. I say we, the Lord has a church, Ukraine. And before the Russians attacked Ukraine, if you didn't know, Russia and Ukraine's in a war. Before the Russians attacked, they were running about 30, 35 people at this little congregation. But Ides is set up and used that as outreach to send supplies and relief. And because of the, the availability of goods and because of the preaching of the gospel, dozens and dozens of people have been led to Christ. They're waiting now for additional baptisms to take place because it's hard to find water in a place to do it. And they're now running over 600 people. A relative of the preacher is a little girl. She appeared, Stephanie said, appeared to be in the picture probably 10, 11 years old. And she was involved in a Russian bomb and she lost her leg. She has a prosthetic that she needs replaced because it doesn't really match. She's growing. She has a prosthetic, and they had her picture in this van. She was going to take food to other people who needed it. The van itself had a roof with a camouflage roof because if you didn't have a camouflage roof, the Russian drones would shoot them down. So as they're going under the threat of being shot down, they're delivering the food to people who are starving. She's our sister in Christ. She's not 12 years old. She's already lost a leg. myself frustrated because Wendy's cost 60 bucks. The dinner's not going to be on, done on time. There's literally a war going on. People are literally fighting for their lives. And because of it, organizations like ours, we're just a personal way that you can help people who are in need. God, God has, he's, he's writing a book called the book of life. And whether your name's in it or not depends on your faithfulness. But look at how the Lord's blessed us. Could we not serve faithfully? David's faith turned a nation around. What can God do with yours or mine? It's time for us to wake up, realize the battle we're in, the spiritual warfare, the time's here, time's now. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says, Today is the day of salvation. If you've never obeyed the gospel, why wouldn't you come tonight? This faith thing, courageous faith and bold faith, is something you can taste for yourself tonight. Faith comes by hearing the word. Believing what you've heard, you can repent of your sins. Make your confession with your lips that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you can be born again. 
that is lowered with Christ in the watery grave, you contact spiritually, according to the scriptures, arise, be baptized, and wash your sins away. You contact his blood so that your sins, not by water, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, are forgiven. You start on a new life. You receive the Holy Spirit according to the scriptures. If you haven't been born again, why won't you come tonight? Why don't we encourage each other in the faith? I don't know when Christ is returning, but I know we're closer right now than we've ever been before. We got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? It's all a matter of perspective. We could share some joy. We could have courageous faith. If only you and I will live it out. Bob's going to come up. I believe that uh, we're going to go ahead and sing at this time, 640. And uh, softly and tenderly. If you have a decision for the cause of Christ, why don't you come tonight? If you need to recommit your life to Christ, if you have any decision, if you want us to pray with you, pray for you, why don't you come as we all stand, as we sing? You think about it for just a moment. Some people are slow or hesitant to believe in Christ. Well, I don't know if that, I don't know if I can trust that Bible and things. And I ask you the question: Who was the president, first president of the United States of America? Who was it? Did you go to school with George? Did you Did you go to school? Bob? Did you know? Did, was he from Ohio? No. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't Ohio. Think about what we accept by faith. You didn't know George Washington. I didn't know George Washington. But think about what we accept by faith. Believing that he, a man named George Washington did live. He did serve in the Revolutionary War. He did lead the troops. He did have bold courage. He did write letters that we have in museums. And he did serve as president of the United States. But what evidence there is for George Washington existing, there's so much more for the existence of this carpenter turned priest you read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's been dead and allegedly raised life now for some 2,000 years. 
And people literally around the globe, their lives have been changed. It's our testimony, all different and individual, but yet in unison we testify he has changed my life. Christian, hadn't he changed yours? Look at the power that he gives and hope that he brings. Standing aside of the cemetery of your loved one. Look at how Jesus Christ has changed the world. Truly nobody with a straight face. Nobody. Not the most uh, committed atheist on the planet. Nobody with a straight face to deny the existence of Jesus Christ. The question you got to answer. Since he did exist, what am I going to do with it? He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord of all. And you've got to decide. But bold and courageous faith, God can use it to turn your life, your family, your community, your workplace upside down. Why don't you give it a try? The devil will always take you back. Why don't you try? God doesn't he doesn't select, it's, it's, it's whosoever will. The decision, it's your choice. As we sing our last verse, there's no feeling you've got to feel, there's no emotion that's got to take place, there's, you don't have to jump any pews. In fact, that could be dangerous, just walk up the aisle. God just calls softly and tenderly. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He's not here, he's risen. The truth of the gospel is power in his blood that all sin can be forgiven. The opportunity today, free water, living water from the throne of God for you to drink up. As we sing our last verse and God calls softly and tenderly, won't you come as we sing? Oh, for the...